Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, welcome back to this lecture number 11 on the course on human behavior. Now what we are going to do in this particular lecture is we are going to see another complex human process which defines our behavior and that is language thought. So the basic of this lecture and the upcoming lecture will be on how language and thought make a complete whole in terms of understanding human behavior or the part played by these two processes which are advanced cognitive processes in determining human behavior. So before we jump into what is language and what is thought and what is the role of language and thought in understanding human behavior as we have been doing in the other lectures. Let us quickly summarize what we have done up till now. This course is a 20 lecture, 8 week capsule where what I will do is I will take you to the very basics of studying human behavior. The first two lectures, what we are trying to do is we are trying to explain the science of psychology which is the basic of all human behaviors. What we did was we looked at how we studied human behavior and what is the need of study of human behavior. We also looked at several techniques of studying human behavior. So we started off those lectures, the introductory lectures uh, by looking at the history of human behavior starting off with the philosophical roots and the physiological roots and then looking at the history of the science of psychology not limiting to structuralism and functionalism but also including behaviorism, gestaltism and psychoanalysis. We also looked at newer schools of psychology for example uh, psycholinguistics, cognitive neuroscience and towards the end of this series we looked at how experimentation is done in psychology. What are the methodologies that psychology has for studying human behavior? We looked at in laboratory experiments, out of the laboratory experiments, we looked at observations, correlations, we looked at things like literature review, all these methods of how to collect data and how to study human behavior. Then we move then to the second process which is sensation which is taking up information from the physical environment and converting it into something that can be encoded in the psychological domain. So if we looked at the properties of systems and processes which acquire information from the physical environment and convert it into the psychological domain. Two properties of interest, sensitivity, so we looked at the details of what is sensitivity and what it comprises of and we looked at sensory coding, the biological process through which this information from the environment is coded into the psychological domain. Towards the end of this lecture, we looked at the idea of how this functions in terms of a model system. So we took I as the model system and we deciphered how the I makes sensation or converts the physical stimulus into the psychological domain. The physical stimulus of interest here being the light particles which is photons. The next section was on perception where we looked at how meaning is acquired from this physical st uh, stimulus that has been encoded through the process of sensation. Five part process, 
is what comprises of the perceptual processing. This includes attention which is focusing on what stimulus to read, localization, deciding where an object is in, is in the external environment, recognition, the process of pattern matching where we take in an external stimulus which has been encoded by sensation into the psychological domain and match it to pre-saved or saved representations, mental representations that are already in the brain. The process of abstraction where we extract useful features from stimuluses or organizations, uh, mental representations which has been encoded through sensation. And the last is constancy which is maintaining the constant or which is acquiring a constant, acquiring a fixed uh, value or acquiring some fixed positions based on which interpretations have to be done. We moved on to the idea of learning and conditioning where we looked at how learning and conditioning these two processes go along and what role does it play in study of human behavior. So, we started off by looking at what is learning. We looked at two basic kinds of learning which is uh, the non-associative and the associative form of learning. Within the uh, non-associative we had sensitization and habituation and within the associative form uh, we looked in detail the classical conditioning, the various parameters of classical conditioning, several other things which are in classical conditioning, factors affecting classical conditioning, how it progresses, how it can be controlled and so on and so forth. We looked at operant conditioning which is another form of associative conditioning where we looked at the parameters of it features like extinction, features like uh, spontaneous recovery, features like conditioning, factors affecting condi uh, operant conditioning and so on and so forth. And lastly, we looked at something called observation learning which is another form of associative conditioning and we looked at how it progresses, what are the uh, various parameters of it and so on and so forth. The last two lectures were focused on memory where we looked at how information which has been learned through the process of learning is stored somewhere. So, we define memory as a three part process where an encoding is transferred into a, some kind of a storage and later on retrieve at some point of time for some verification or some kind of a use. And so, uh, initially we define two models of uh, memory, the attention shift model which talks of memory as a three part store connected by a serial processor. And uh, the processing happening through active processes like attention or rehearsals. So, that is what uh, we were actually uh, doing or that is what we were actually talking about in the first part of the lecture on memory. In the second part of lecture on memory, we took on several variables. We looked at the idea of working memory and we looked at how does the acting memory function, the various parameters of working memory, we looked at what is long term memory, how does long term memory function, uh, parameters of long term memory, then types of long term memory, what kind of information is stored in long term memory and a whole other kind of uh, informations and a number of uh, information which is related to human memory. So, up till now we have dealt with these sections and these processes of uh, psychology, these uh, parts of psychology which help us understand any human behavior because any human behavior has all these parts integrated together. Any behavior that you see has uh, sensation, has perception, has uh, learning, has memory. From today onwards, we will be moving on to the higher processes, right? And Today will be a set of lecture where we will be ending our study of higher cognitive processes and moving on to some abstract terms like emotion, personality and social influences which are also part of hum studying human behavior or part of the study of psychology. So, today's lecture what we are going to do is we are fo focusing on something called language and thought process. Now, before we acquaint you to what language is and what is the role it has in terms of uh, understanding human behavior or explaining human behavior. Uh, let me start off by how language helps us in understanding human behavior. So, during the 1960s people in mostly in the European countries and, and the United States they were fond of jogging and they started jogging a lot and so this whole health gamut came up and people started a lot of people started doing jogging at all points of time. And therein came the idea of something called runner's high. 
Now, runner's high is a system or is, is a state where people who actually jog a lot, they feel heightened or they, uh, their uh, body system, their homeostasis goes to a uh, high, they feel high. Now, it was believed that the question was why were these runners who were not taking any drugs as such, why were they feeling high similar to uh, this high which was similar to other drugs which were, which were uh, available in the market. And so, a systematic hypothesis was created and this hypothesis uh, was tested on using biological methods where it was found out that the body releases certain kind of endorphins, uh, these, these endorphins are very similar to uh, external drugs which actually raises uh, or gives you a certain kind of a high. Now, initially this was what the proof was, this was what the test was and so uh, people around the world started believing that the body produces its own uh, drug, own uh, uh, self stimulating or self activating system. Later on a lot of study was done and it was found out that these endorphins had no role whatsoever to play in the runner's high. What our interest is through this experiment is to show how language, thought and thought processes actually help you solve problems or study human behaviors. So, initially the runner's high which was thought to be or uh, runner's high that people were uh, feeling that was through a process of thinking it was related to the idea that it was produced by the body itself or this was similar to uh, morphine to the idea of how external drugs actually give you a high. And through a, uh, through a well structured hypothesis testing or a, or a scientific method of thinking and problem solving, it was uh, labeled that these toxins or these activating uh, drugs like morphine, uh, a drug similar to morphine uh, was produced by the body, a natural system by the body and these drugs were named as endorphin. Later on with the testing uh, and, and well thought experiments, it was found out that endorphins which are similar to morphine or uh, the drug which acti hyper activates you, uh, this had no role to play whatsoever and through process of language it was explained how these things are different. So, this is the role of language because language is a very basic property that humans share. Now, there is a difference between language and communication. Communication is a medium of exchange of ideas between two uh, human beings or two beings as for that matter. Now, why I am not uh, using the term human beings is because uh, we, we differentiate ourselves from animals saying that we are human beings and they are uh, animals, but that is a, that's a, a, a very narrow way of looking at it because we also are animals. Now, the thing is communication is a medium of exchange of ideas. Now, these ideas could be very primitive ideas for example, it could be ideas uh, similar to what honeybees uh, do to show the rest of the honeybee. So, if, if a honeybee uh, finds a flower or nectar from a flower or patch of flowers, what it does is it return back to uh, its own uh, nest and then does a particular kind of dance and this dance tells two or three, sends two or three information or communicates two or three informations to other honeybees. One being that it has found a source of uh, something, it could be nectar, it could be water and where it is, which direction it is and that kind of information is uh, shown by this honeybee dance which is, which looks like an infinity dance. Similarly, other primary organisms like uh, whales, bears, bird songs, uh, birds, these are all communicating mediums and so communication is basically a process, a medium of exchanging ideas between uh, two groups of people or two groups of organisms. Language is a little bit different. Language is that property which is acquired only by human beings. Language is something which is not present in other forms of animals. Now, uh, animals do have a form of language, but it is very, very uh, poor and so they cannot articulate, they cannot speak, they cannot actually uh, exchange ideas or exchange many dimensional ideas among themselves. So, that is one difference between language and 
communication. So communication is a is a medium of exchanging ideas and language is more than medium of exchanging ideas. You can produce uh, many forms of uh, vocalizations, produce thoughts, thought processes, produce many other things or many other communi communicate many other a lot of ideas through it. So, let us then begin our, our, our discussions on language and thought and look at what is language, what are the basics of it and how does it actually progress. So, as I was saying let us start uh, looking back at what is language and try and introduce to you what is language and how it is different from communication and what the role does language play in uh, studying human behavior. So, language is known to be a primary means of communicating a particular thought. Any idea that we have as human beings, any idea that we have we communicate through the use of certain language. And so, these languages are well formed sounds or well formed words and sentences which we express and uh, other people uh, hear or other people express and we hear and that is how we communicate certain ideas or certain facts. Now, these ideas could be a warning, it could be a compliment, it could be any kind of thing. So, whole lot of things can be communicated through certain languages. Now, the there are two levels of language. As we looked at, language has two different aspects. Now, every language, be it be it German, be it French, be it English, be it Hindi, any language which is there. So, language is basically a, st a structured way of uh, using symbols, certain symbols to communicate certain ideas. And so, what you should know is that the symbols used in language has no direct relation to the idea which has been communicated through it. So, there it is, it is an arbitrary relation. Right? And so, the same idea can be communicated by multiple languages and multiple symbols. And so, there is no relation between the language, the, the symbol that you are using to produce a language and communicating the idea. So, ideas, same idea uh, or the same speech can be, uh, can be expressed through a sign language, it could be expressed through English, Hindi and many different languages. Now, most languages have two aspects to look at or two aspects to worry about. One is the production and the other is the comprehension. So, not only do humans produce a language, they can also comprehend a language. Now, producing a language is equivalent to actually verbalizing a particular thought or verbalizing a particular communication. So, human beings at one end, they start communicating, they start producing using these symbols, forming a chain of thought and then not only chain of thought passing this information. So, when we are producing language, what we are actually doing is we start off from the bottom up process, we start think of a particular idea, then from that idea we comprehend that idea and then lay and then try and break it down into a form of uh, communication, a form of symbols and then we look at how these symbols would be arranged by a particular grammar and then we produce these symbols and then we communicate. This is one way of actually looking at language from the production point of view. From the comprehension point of view, the reverse is true. So, somebody produces a certain language, we comprehend at the level of where the symbol is being produced, then look at how the symbols are arranged, look at the grammar of how they are arranged, make, take up the basic ideas and from that basic idea, they come up with a thought that is being communicated to us. And so, there, the, the processes are reversed. So, basically the language that most of us, uh, for us, uh, which, is, which is valid is the English language. Now, if you look at the English language, the English language generally has 40 different phonemes. Now, it is believed that the number of uh, phonemes which are present in the world is approximately 200, but the English language is known to have something called 20 different phonemes. And what these phonemes actually do is that these phonemes, the basic speech uh, that anybody can produce, any human being can produce. Now, this can be, the basic phonemes can be as simple as So, the B phoneme which is the B in the boy or the T phoneme which can be the T in the toy. So, the basic speech sound that human beings produce is what is the phoneme and in English language these are 
40 in numbers. Now it's amazing that these 40 phonemes when they are combined together in different different combinations and permutations this can actually lead to 70,000 different words and when these words when they combine together they can produce millions of sentences which are there. So the human language that we know the English language that we know starts off with 40 phonemes which in its arrangement uh, can produce some a large number of uh, words which produces a even large number of sentences. The whole uh, English language or the whole written English language is basically dependent on the 40 different phonemes which are out there. Now production of a language begins with a thought which is translated into a sentence and ends with a sound expressing that sentence. As I said the production part of a language when you speak, so if this is your mouth, if you are speaking this production starts with a thought process. So you think of something first and then you translate that into some type of a sentence. Now this sentence is how the arrangement of the symbols will be there. So sentences are what? Sentences are certain arrangements of symbols. For example, look at A. Now A is a symbol which is a similar similar to A in the Hindi language. Now both of them are similar but both of them are a m and look at this both of these symbols point towards the fruit mango right uh, it could also mean common in in hindi but if we translate that that is what it is so uh, this spelling and this spelling corresponds to this fruit. So basically how production of language begins is it begins with the thought process and then it is translated to some kind of a sentence which is basically the arrangement of these symbols and then ends with producing sounds expressing these sentences. So first these sentences are there and these sentences are then spelled out. You actually go ahead and spell out this uh, language with a, with a combination of certain phoneme. For example, the boy is weak if this is what we are thinking if we are thinking of a weak boy if we see a weak boy and if you want to comprehend that or if you want to uh, produce this sentence for uh, or want to express this sentence to other people what we will do is we will produce a, a sentence like this and this sentence then is translated back by reading it for example the boy is weak and if you look at it it will be in terms of the phoneme so boy is v e k this is how it is translated. So this in terms of the basic speech sound. Now in terms of comprehension what happens is comprehension of a language begins by hearing the sound. So in comprehension, in understanding, in hearing or in uh, in understanding the meaning which somebody ha else, else has produced, so understanding the meaning of a sentence which somebody else has produced, you start off by hearing the first sounds then attaching meaning to the sounds. So, so every word for example the word bank. Now depending on the context this bank will have different different meaning and so this attaching of meaning is important and from once you have attached the meaning you attach meaning to the combination of words and a sentence and then it leads to the final thought process or the idea that is being generated or being thrown at you. Language and communication. So language units and processes. What are the basic units of language or what are the basic parts of language and how do they help in communication? What are the processes in language? So language is structured at three different levels. Most language, written language is structured at three different levels. We have the level of speech sound, we have the level of word and we have the level of sentence. These are the three levels which are there. So we will look at the three levels one by one. Let us start with the speech level or the level of speech sounds. Now speech is a sequence of phonemes, shortest segment of speech that carries meaning. So at the level of speech, language can be expressed in terms of phones. These are the basic speech sounds. For example, B, D, E, 
these are the basic sounds now if you ever pick up a dictionary you will see that these are definition that you have of any word you will see the basic phonetics of it so these basic speech sounds are called phones and the combination of these phones together is what is called the phoneme so each language has certain phones certain basic sounds and these sounds when they combine together to form a larger sound for example ba in bat b and a so two phones combine together that is called a phoneme the idea that two speech sounds combine together to form a phoneme so shortest segment of speech that carries meaning and when phonemes are combined together right way we perceive them as words so when the phonemes are combined together in right way for example if we combine these phonemes together we get the idea of a boy or we get the word of a boy now speech generally is perceived to be continuous most people when they talk you think that i am talking in a continuous manner but if i do a spectrography of this speech if i measure the uh, pressure or the way air is flowing out of my mouth you will see that speech is a non continuous thing and so uh, it's 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 not actually the way i am speaking is not continuous it's, it's broken down into its part that's what uh, it's it's believed to be this continuity it comes through the idea that these phonemes are together or they are placed together now the use of phoneme or the usefulness of phoneme can be understood by this particular example so in a boy if i replace the phoneme b y the phoneme t boy now becomes toy and so what happens is the concept is changed the idea is changed and that is the power of a phoneme or that is the use of a phoneme now again i'll what i'll suggest is if you want to go into details of uh, how language works you should be referring to my lecture on cognitive psychology where i have done an extensive uh, lectures on what is language and how it is produced and what is the usefulness of it so what we'll do here is we'll just look at the basics of what is language and how does it help in uh, understanding human behavior so basically these phonemes they combine together to form uh, words or they, to form something called morphemes which again combine together to form something called words so before we go into the word unit there is something more that you should be able to understand first we are very good at discriminating among different speech sounds corresponding to different phonemes but poor at discriminating among a uh, different sound corresponding to the same phoneme so if we look at different phonemes we are very good at discriminating among different phonemes right but when we are discriminating speech sounds within the same phoneme so phones within the same phoneme we are very poor at doing that for example look at the word pin now if you look at pin this is how it is written p i n if the same phoneme or same word is now written as spin and the phoneme that we are interested in is p now when you pronounce pin you will look at or you will see that the phoneme p comes out with a puff of air take your hand place it in front of your mouth and try saying pin when you pronounce the word p a puff of air comes in but when the same phoneme is included in a different uh, word or different morpheme or word in this case then when you produce the p phoneme in spin there is no puff of word so we are very good at discriminating within the same phoneme discriminating phones within the same phoneme but when it comes to discriminating in other words it is a little bit difficult or it is a little bit problematic now different phone is why we cannot understand different foreign languages now what happens is when we are learning another language when we are learning different uh, languages different foreign languages each of these foreign languages has different different phonemes or different different speech sounds and that is one reason why it is very difficult for us to learn other foreign languages or different foreign languages now look at uh, the way bus is spelled now english people would call this as bus but if you look at german they will say this as bus they don't have the us the 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 strictest form of s and u and so they'll say this is bus zug and so the phones are different or they don't have the z word the s word is not pronounced in too much of german so you will have uh, things things 
that is how the pronunciations are right and so since different different languages are different different phonemes and since we do not know these phonemes those speech sounds it is very difficult for us to understand different foreign languages. For example, the word P right is pronounced in two different ways in the Hindi language the same P if we pronounce the phoneme P in English language it is it is pronounced in the same way but if we pronounce uh, the phoneme P in Hindi there are two different ways of pronouncing the same speech sound. Also, uh, the idea that different languages are different phonemes and because of that different phonemes make uh, language learning difficult. Another example of this is that the R phoneme and the L phoneme is approximately same in Japanese and that is why rice and lice are pronounced similarly or thought of similarly. So, lice is what they say for rice as well as lice right L I C E or R I C E most Japanese people will pronounce it in the same way because they do not have a different phoneme for the R and the L. Also what is the usefulness of phoneme? What is the need of phoneme? Now another usefulness of phoneme is phonemes actually tell you what uh, words cannot be possible. For example, the word bet. Now, bet is possible in English language, but then the English language says that you cannot add a b uh, after a p phoneme. That is an incorrect way of uh, speaking English or that is not allowed. Now, if I put a p before a b and English language does not support it, I uh, will get a word like feebat which is actually not a word. And so, these kind of non-words are also a part of how phonemes decide language or phonemes basically help you in understanding language. With the help of phonemes, it can also be explained that words like zook which are a non-word, if I want to make a plural of this, we will say zooks that is the plural because this is a non-word and so, so the idea is that phonemes also uh, help us decide for what words can exist, what plurals can exist and what cannot. But if we have a word like zug and this word. Now, we know that the plural will turn out to be zooks. So, we will have a z kind of a plural, but in terms of a z u k which is a non word, the plural will be a s. Now, zug is actually a train in German and so that is possible. So, phonemes also help us decide what kind of plurals or what kind of words can exist and what kind of words cannot exist. So, this is the level of at the level of the speech sound at the level of the phoneme, how these phonemes actually help us in understanding language or making language. The second unit at which language works, a second unit of production of language or comprehension of language is at the level of word unit. So, we have just seen that different phonemes, basic speech sounds or phones for that matter combine to produce something called words. Now, even before we uh, produce words, there are also some kind of words which are called suffixes and prefixes. For example, the word ly or uh, un. Now, these are also words although they do not convey full meaning, but then when put in front of a word it actually changes the meaning of it and this is what is the level which we call morpheme. So, what we are doing here is that two different phonemes l and y they combine together to form a word which is called ly. Now, on itself ly does not have any meaning, but this is a suffix because the moment we add ly to the word time, it says timely which basically means that time is a word and timely means that an action which is being done on time, a repetition action. Similarly, a uh, prefix uh, such as un, if you use this un before time, it will become untimely which is the negative of time or negative of not being on time. And so, these basic word sounds or these basic words which actually are combination of certain phonemes but which are not true words also help us in producing languages and these are what are called morphemes. So, these small words combination of phonemes uh, which are exactly not full words are called the morphemes. So, morphemes generally are words like Morphemes are combination of phonemes which are not true words, but actually help a true word help in the formation of true word. For example, a and the prepositions like of and on all of these are morphemes. Now, these kind of morphemes 
that is used in the English language are called grammatical morphemes because they help in deciding a grammar or they help in forming a particular kind of a grammar. Now, these words, so when, when, when listening, we perceive not only phonemes but different words and these words actually come from the idea of morphemes or different morphemes combined together to produce a word. So, when we are listening, we perceive not only phonemes and morphemes but, but we also perceive word. Now, what is word? The perception of word is not enough because from the word we have to extract the meaning of it. And so, language, the use of language is not restricted to uh, the understanding of a word or what is word by the way. Word is actually a represented by a certain kind of a meaning. So, word represents meaning and meaning is what we extract from these words. The words are composed of certain symbols which are phonemes and these phonemes combine to form certain kind of a morpheme. So, phonemes are the basic speech sound. Now, these basic speech sound they combine together to form morpheme which is the simplest word and these simplest words then combine together to form something called word which has certain kind of a meaning. Now, words are the name of a concept. Words generally are, what are words? Words are names of concepts and meaning is the concept itself, right. So, the name of a concept is called the word and the meaning is generally the concept itself or the name of the word or the word name. Right? So, this is what the difference is. So, at the level of the word unit, when listening, we perceive not only phonemes but words. Morphemes are the smallest linguistic unit which carry the meaning. So, this is lie or un or an on this kind of words which are grammatical phonemes, they also uh, possess certain meanings. Now, most morphemes are generally word. Grammatical morphemes, for example, words that make sentences grammatically processed differently to consonant words. For example, a an, on, up, all of these are morphemes which are simple words which have certain meaning and they are grammatical in nature. Why they are grammatical phonemes? Because they help us processing differently from con uh, content words. Of, so for example, book, on the table, book, in the table. Now, look at it. The word on and in decides where it is. So, when the book is on the table, it is on top of the table. But when it says the book is in the table, the book is inside the table. And so, these grammatical phonemes or these grammatical morphemes actually help us decide what meaning is being conveyed with it. Now, content word like table and book, they will not change. But the use of on or in or at or other words and book, a book, the book kind of a thing. So, the book is that particular book and book is any book. So, that, that these particular words actually tell help you decide meaning or extract meaning from different words. Also, sometimes what happens is certain words may have multiple meaning or ambiguous meaning. For example, look at the word club. Now, this club can have two meanings. It can be in terms of a social organization, a social organization or it can also be a striking object. So, club is like a rod, a strike object from through which you uh, strike. Now, the thing is when these kind of ambiguous words are there, then the meaning is generated or there are multiple meanings are which are available at that point of time. Now, the thing was since this word club has multiple meaning, linguists were worried about the fact that how do people decide which meaning will be relevant and which meaning will not be relevant or uh, which meaning will be processed and which meaning will not be processed or whether both the meanings are available to us. So, if I say I want to join the club, now when I say I want to join the club or he wanted to join the club, what meaning is available and what meaning is not available and that was what the question was and to decide that what meaning was perceived or uh, how meaning was generated from words, an experiment was done in which a word, a simple word uh, like he wanted to join the club was uh, told to people. Later on, they were tested with a particular uh, word. They were tested with a particular word, a word was given to them and they were supposed to 
announce or they were supposed to uh, repeat aloud the test word after this word was written. Now it was found out when the test word matched the meaning of the word club then people were able to respond faster or the club the idea of uh, club or, or the test word but when the test word had a meaning or test word had no similarity to both definitions of club then they were slower in repeating this word which basically means that when we are reading a word and is this word is ambiguous both the meanings are available to us the context of the word for example I want to join a club at the moment I say this at the point when I end the sentence which is I want to join the club both the meanings of club the striking object as well as the social organization is available to me but the context that I want to join a club where the only the social organization is the most meaningful word here or the most meaningful meaning of the word club which is available here that will be available or the second meaning of club will be uh, thrown out or that will not be used and so this experiment actually proves that both the meanings are available while uh, perceiving sentences or extracting meaning from certain sentences. Now the third unit of language and comprehension at which language can be processed is that the language units and processes and that is at the level of the sentence. Now corresponding to parts of thought prepositions and allow listeners to extract prepositions from different sentences. Now at the level of sentence so I have a basic level which is the phoneme. Now this phoneme then combines with many other phonemes to produce the, the word boy which is the level of word and then I have at the level of sentence. Now at the level of sentence this word is now arranged with certain other words in following certain grammatical rules following certain rules of producing language to produce a sentence. Now this sentence is what we are talking about here so corresponding to the parts of thought uh, and so this particular sentence it relates two thoughts the boy ate the pie. Now if I look at it the sentence can be divided into two different parts it has two thoughts here first the boy and then the pi and the third thought is 8. So then there is an object or there is a uh, sorry the subject here not an object so this is the subject so then the subject in this sentence how do we process language in terms of words then we make from words we make sentences and if you look at the simple sentence the boy ate the pie the subject of this uh, there are two thoughts actually here or there are two uh, prepositions which are here first the boy which is the subject in this case and ate the pie which is the object ate is the verb which says that the boy ate the pie so the pie was eaten by the boy whichever way you look into it so who ate the pie the boy what did the boy ate the pie and so this is called the predicate and this is how most sentences are actually defined so, so in order to express meaning or in order to express uh, certain thoughts we use sentences and the sentences can be broken down into two parts the subject and the predicate the subject is the one who is doing the action the predicate is where the action is being held or it can also be said as subject and objects and this is the verb so if you look into it this is the word which signifies action it is called the action verb and this is called the verb and so that defines what is being happening so then there are two thoughts which have been expressed here first is there is somebody called the boy who is a boy and he is doing something which is eating the pie. So the question is the boy did what? He ate a pie. Similarly who ate the pie? The boy ate the pie and so thoughts are being sent here or are being uh, translated here. Propositions can be further divided into subjects and predicate that is the description as I said uh, if I take another sentence Audrey has curly hair. Now if I take this sentence the subject is Audrey which is the on which the action is happening and Audrey has what this is called the predicate this is Audrey had curly has also another way of dividing this sentence for example let us take the sentence the tailor is asleep. Now if you look at this, this is the subject the tailor who is doing what? He is asleep. Now if you look at this sentence or if you look at this sentence Audrey has curly hairs, this can also be divided into its part not only a subject as predicate but also in terms of phrases. For example, the Audrey 
part is the noun phrase and has curly hair is part of the verb phrase. Why it is called verb phrase? Now, what is phrase? Phrase is a part of a sentence which makes meaning but not complete meaning. So, if I say Audrey, it is a phrase, it is a noun phrase. Why it is a noun phrase? Because it makes meaning. Audrey is the name of someone or in this case has curly hairs. Now, has curly hairs, if I say has curly hairs, it is a part of a sentence which makes complete meaning. Since it is beginning with a verb, it is called the verb phrase and it although does not tell you somebody has a curly hair, but it says her has a curly hair which basically means that if you add something into it, it has some meaning, it is giving meaning to it. And so, sentences can also be divided not only in terms of subject and predicate, it can also be divided in terms of noun phrase and verb phrase. And within the noun phrase and within the verb phrase, we can actually move sentences or move parts of the sentences together and that is called move or changing the syntactic structure of a sentence. But we will not go into that detail here. So, basically then how do we understand language? Language starts with something called phonemes or phones. The next uh, level is morphemes, which are phonemes combined together to phonemes combined together to give simple words. Then, from the level of the morpheme, we had the level of word. Now, words are concepts which have meaning, and these words are then formed into sentences. Sentences are prepositions which have ideas into them and which can be communicated between people. So, syntactic analysis, another uh, aspect of language is syntactic analysis. When listening, we divide sentences into its noun phrase, verb phrase, etcetera, then extract prepositions from the word. The example that we took in the last class uh, or in the last slide. The boy is going to the village. If you look into it, this uh, sentence can be divided into two parts. This is the noun phrase and this is the verb phrase. If you look into it, the boy. So, that is what is who is going to the village? The boy. What is the boy doing? He is going to the village. Now, within the verb phrase, this is since go is the word and going is uh, the verb phrase. So, again we can decide this. So, within the verb phrase, I will have the verb which is going and then I will have another noun phrase which is to the market, to the village or market. So, then I can change between. So, within this syntactic structure, I can change the idea that who is going. So, he is going. So, is is a connector here and so that kind of a thing is there. And so, there are two, if you look into this kind of a syntactic structure or this sentence, there are two propositions which are here or there are two ideas which are being floated here. One is that there is a boy and second is he is going somewhere. Where is he going? To the village. And so, that kind of a thing or a language can do that kind of a thing where it can express ideas, ideas using certain kind of symbols. Now, syntax deals with relationships between words in phrases and sentences. So, syntax is basically the rule, how it should be combined. Now, if I say the boy going to village, it is not correct or boy going is also not correct. So, certain grammatical rules are used, certain syntactic rules are used, certain rules of usage are used for making propositions, certain ideas float. Now, uh, for example, if I look at the sentence like the green bird ate the red snake. Now, what I am doing here is when I am saying the green bird ate the uh, red snake, what I am trying to tell you is that there is a green bird and he is the person or he is the thing which is acting, which is eating. Now, what did he eat? The red snake. Now, it is not the red snake which is eating the green bird or neither it is the green bird which is being eaten by the red snake. The proposition here, the meaning that I am trying to express here through this sentence is that there is a bird which is green in color and there is a snake which is red in color. So, neither the bird is red in color, neither the snake is green in color, nor the snake is eating the bird nor the bird is being eaten by the snake. What is happening here is that there is a green color bird which is actually eating the snake and so that is called the syntactic analysis. Now, the problems arise when we have sentences in which this syntactic analysis or this kind of a grammar is not ambiguous. For example, look at this sentence. The horse ran past the barn fell. Now, if you look at the sentences, the horse ran past, the barn fell. 
Now, this is called the garden part sentence. If you look into it, what is the problem? The problem is we do not know how to process the sentence. As soon as you read the sentence, it says the horse ran past the barn fell. Now, there is no meaning. So, as you are progressing down the sentence, it makes meaning to you, but then you quickly understand that fell is out of place. And so, what happens is the meaning is not generated. And so, in this kind of ambiguous sentences, syntax plays a lot of role because this is this is not having the right syntax. So, if you use the right syntax, then this word which is called the garden path sentence, which is called an ambiguous sentence actually starts meaning, uh, make meaning. So, what we do is initially I would have said the horse is what is the noun phrase and ran past the barn is the verb phrase, but that is not correct because if I do that, if I if I put ran past the uh, barn as the verb phrase and the horse as the noun phrase, then the sentence will not be complete because I have a word which is fell again a noun, uh, again a verb which is at the end of it. So, what I do is then I put the horse ran past the barn as the noun phrase and fell as the verb phrase and now it is correct. It is the short form of the sentences, the horse ran past the barn and fell. Right? And so, this is what sentences are all about or syntax are all about and the, how they make a uh, possible understanding of meaning. Now, effects of context. Now, the, uh, the context in which a particular speech is processed has also a lot to do with perception of ideas or perception of prepositions which are passed on through a language. If you look into the way understanding a sentence and producing a sentence goes. Now, when you are producing a sentence, you start at the level of a sentence unit, then you come to the morpheme unit which is words and then you come to the phoneme unit when you are uh, producing a sentence. But when you are understanding a sentence, you start, start at the level of the morpheme level, you start understanding, you start understanding or hearing what the words are saying and then make meaning out of it and then finally derive the so, the, the preposition that is being passed on to. So, basically context has a lot of uh, work or a lot of role to play into how language is processed. Context is important in comprehension and production for setting the scene of giving insights into a speaker's intention. For example, background knowledge of a particular sentence, a background knowledge of where the sentence is coming from has a lot of role to play in, in terms of what ideas are being processed or what are ideas are being put forward. For example, if I ask you the question, can you pass the potato and if I am sitting with you in a dinner table or other people on a dinner table and the question is, can you pass the potato? It is not the question of whether I have the ability to pass the potato or do I have the strength, the physical strength to pass the potato. The question being asked here is that please can you pass the potato. The question is whether he can pass the potato not in terms of the strength, physical strength, but please pass the potato is what the meaning of the sentence is. But if somebody has a sling on it or somebody has a fracture or in his hand and the same question is being asked, can you pass the potato? Now, in this case, the person who is putting the, the word is actually questioning the strength of the person. Can you pass the potato actually means whether you have the ability to pass the potato from one place to another. Similarly, in the production of language also, the context has a lot of part to play. So, it, in terms of comprehension, I just showed to you how meaning differs and in terms of what the context is or in what background the language is being produced. Similarly, if I ask the question, where is Empire State Building? Now, the answer to that will depend upon where I am. Now, if I am in Seattle, I will say it is in New York or if I am in Europe, I will say it is in the US. But when I am in the United States I'll, or in Seattle, I will say it is in New York. But if I am in New York and if you ask the same question to me, when is uh, where is Empire State Building? Particularly, I will say 33 and 66 West. That is the I do not know if that is the address of the uh, Empire State Building, but that is the number that I will give you. I will give you the exact number. So, depending on where I am, in which context I am, that will decide what type of speech I make and what type of uh, comprehension can be generated or what kind of information is being transferred. So, context has a lot of role to play. Now, language and communication. What is the neural basis of languages? Now, there are two regions of the brain. One is called the Broca area and the other is called the Wernicke area, which is responsible for producing languages or which is responsible for comprehension language. Now, any uh, damage to these area, both are in the left hemisphere uh, of the brain and so any damage to these areas will actually be uh, inhibiting language. So, two regions in the left hemisphere are critical for language production or uh, comprehension. Broca's area, which is the posterior part of the front 
frontal lobe and vertical area which is the temporal region. Now, damage to either of these areas leads to specific kinds of uh, aphasia breakdown in the language. For example, in Broca's aphasia, so if the Broca area is damaged, what will happen is a disruption of the syntactic stage will happen. So, you will be able to produce language, but then you will not be able to understand the syntax of it. Uh, you will be uh, able to flawlessly uh, produce words, but then extracting meaning is difficult. But if you have Wernicke aphasia, disruption at the word level and concept level will happen. So, you will not be able to understand what is the concept. So, I will produce speech perfectly, but what is the meaning of the speech I will not be able to generate. In this case, what will happen is disruption in the syntactic level. So, I will at the level of grammar, there will be a problem. So, I will be able to speak, but there will be several, several grammatical flaws. So, I understand the meaning, but I do not know how to put it together. And so, these type, two types of aphasias are there. This is not only these two aphasias, there are many other aphasias or damage to brain regions which can lead to uh, problems in language formation. Now, another question is in terms of development of language, whether it is acquired. Now, phonemes and combination of phonemes. Now, children, it is uh, whether phonemes are acquired or how it is acquired, what is acquired and what is not. So, phonemes are, it is believed that phonemes are acquired and so most children actually when they start, for small children when they are born, they can speak any language that they want right or they can learn any language that they want and so by the age of 3 to 6 months they produce speech sounds which are similar to most languages in the world. But then what happens is as you grow older, as you become 6 months of age, what happens is you start producing certain phonemes in your language and forgetting certain other phonemes and this is what is actually happening. So, children are uh, able to describe it among different sounds that corresponds to different phonemes. During the first year, children learn which phonemes are relevant for their particular language. Over the next few years, learn how to combine these phonemes together. So, initially when they are born, they can produce any kind of phoneme which is which is there, any kind of speech sound which is there, for example, ba, da and that kind of a thing. But then as they grow in age, they start learning only the phonemes from their language and later on, they start understanding and mixing these phonemes together to produce language. Words and concepts. And now, right from the one and a half years to two and a half years of age, children start combining these phonemes together to produce words. So, initially they produce simple words and then they start understanding that uh, these simple words are not true. So, they start doing an over extension. For example, uh, let us say doggy, they have learned the word doggy. So, what they start doing is they, they start doing something called over justification. So, they take this doggy and try applying it to cats and also on and so forth and later on they realize that this is not possible, this kind of thing is not possible and they start narrowing down or understanding the, the grammars of it. Now, later on at some at two and a half years of age or around three years of age, they start making simple sentences not with grammar. For example, dad, hat, wear kind of a sentence and then as you progress early by four years of age, you understand the grammar as well as the sentence as well as the, uh, the phoneme and morphemes. So, when children start speaking around one year of age, first use words that relate to family concept example, family name, animal name and so on and so forth. Around one and a half years of age, children use around 25 words and by six years, children use around 15,000 different words from primitive to complex sentences. Between the age of one and a half to two and a half years, children acquire sentences units starts with combining single words into two word utterances and rapidly progressing to more complex sentences to express prepositions and more clearly. So, as I said, initially what happens is children develop single sentences and they start extending the concept of single sentences to other sentences as well. And so, by a process of learning and conditioning, they start uh, understanding that this extension is not working. So, using dog for a cat or a cow uh, is not really working and so this what uh, what they do is they start learning names of these uh, different animals and then initially they start combining these names together to form very simple sentences very simple sentences uh, as uh, jake eat dad go kind of a thing later on they start understanding the grammar of it of how to combine it all together to form simple sentences and that is how the progression really works learning processes. So, how is learning uh, then taking place in children? Uh, it is through the process of imitation and conditioning. Now, possibilities that children learn by imitating adults, imitation or by being rewarded for producing sentences correctly and punished for mistakes which is conditioning. So, children are known to learn sentences or language through two processes. One is imitation. Now, in imitation what happens is a parent actually shows a particular uh, object to a child saying that this is telephone. So, telephone and the child imitates that. So, one way of learning for children is imitating parents when they 
talk or when they show something to children and that is how they develop. But that may not be the only way in which children actually learn language. The other way in which they learn language is through conditioning. Now in conditioning what happens is a parent actually gives you a reward or the children a reward when they produce the correct sentences. And so another word of learning is for example they show the small child a dog and when the dog says it is a dog he is rewarded and that makes him learn that this is a dog or say simple sentences for example watch they show the watch and uh, when the child says it is a watch then he is rewarded otherwise he is actually corrected and so there are two ways of learning one is through imitation the other is through conditioning problem with these possibilities is that they focus on specific utterances the problem is that although these two possibilities of copying or imitating or conditioning can be one of the reasons of how children learn language but the problem is that these possibilities are they focus on specific utterances how do children overextend concepts or how do children produce complex sentences that sometimes even adults don't say so some sentences which adults don't express how do children learn those kind of sentences so if it is imitation or conditioning they should be dependent on the parent or learning new words for that matter how do the children produce this matter so it's not only simple imitation or conditioning which make children learn they also do some Thing called hypothesis testing. They also learn through some other methods through hypothesis testing. So, what is hypothesis testing? In which children appear to form hypothesis about a rule of language, test it and retain it if it works. So, what children then tend to do is that they make certain hypotheses about where a sentence would go or where a part of a sentence would go and then they keep on adding this. So, uh, cow moo, dog moo, so moo is the word or dark, dog bark, cat bark that kind of a thing and they test this hypothesis with everything. Man goes, dog goes or uh, he worked, they worked, they ate it that kind of a sentence they start using and then they realize slowly realize that ed is not something which is to be added with every kind of a uh, noun or every kind of a verb and later on they start correcting so one of the ways that they learn is through hypothesis testing now hypotheses are generated according to a few op operating principles example playing attention to word endings looking for prefixes and suffixes that indicate change in meaning and avoid exceptions so what they do is they <coughs> start playing around with word endings they start playing around with certain suffixes and prefixes for example, animate, so inanimate, unanimate, so untimely, so they will use the un in some other word, for example, unanimate kind of a thing. And so they extend this way, this, this particular uh, thing, this particular thought, this particular word ending and start uh, making sentences. So the ones for which they are rewarded, they learn, the ones which they are not rewarded, they will leave it or they will uh, let it go. So innate factors, the richness of innate knowledge. One indicator for this richness is children in all cultures seem to go through similar process in acquiring certain uh, languages. So basically there are certain innate factors which have also been proposed and it is it comes from the idea that uh, people or children in all cultures, they go through certain uh, similar process of acquiring language. So uh, also the idea that there are certain critical periods, for example, first months of life are critical period for learning phonemes for the native language and it is harder to learn sound systems for a second language later in life. Now it is found that when an adult start learning a later language or a second language in a later life, it becomes very difficult for them. But if children learn them, where it is very easy because phoneme learning is very easy for them. Now this uh, system says that language learning is actually innate in children. Indirect evidence for critical periods of language acquisition is from children who experience social isolation. So if put a child into a social isolation, this child will actually never produce a phoneme or never produce higher phonemes or higher sentences. Critical period for learning syntax, studies of deaf people have uh, said or suggested that there are certain critical periods for learning syntax. Can another species learn human language? Now that's another interesting question. Other species have communication systems, but most argue that these are qualitatively different from our own uh, language system. Now a lot of other species, for example, gorillas or uh, monkeys or apes have been trained and there are several experiments which have been done with apes and it has been found that these apes actually learn language but they, they cannot learn the sophistication so at the best there was another a monkey study which was done where this monkey actually learned certain certain 1500 to 2000 words uh, I think 2000 or 6000 words they were able to express sign language but they were not able to express ideas like a small children did and also it took many years it took many years for this monkey to learn this whereas small children or children by the age of one or two years or three years they develop this particular language. So the idea that other species can also learn language is also questionable. Now 
let us take a recap of what we did today. So, what we did today we, I, is I introduced to you the idea of what is language and what is the different forms of or different sections of language or different stratas of language and how does language actually help us in studying uh, human behavior. So, what language does is it helps us in communicating and transferring ideas from or transferring propositions from one person to another or one system to another and that is how it actually helps us in understanding or uh, in, in studying human behavior. So, up till we meet next time uh, and continue with uh, language and thinking processes, it is goodbye from here.